it doesn't matter if it's um, divorce court. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's an adoption. It doesn't matter if it's a contract uh, dispute. It doesn't matter if it's uh, child custody, child support. Um, everything done in the courts today is done under equity. And when we talk about equity, we're talking about contract law. In contract law, um, everything everything through the courts is done under contract. Your judge is sitting on the bench under contract. The prosecutor is under contract. The uh, public defender, even though it's supposed to be at uh, state expense for you, um, he is still under contract, he or she. And um, basically uh, what we're talking about there is every last one of those participants in this system has to abide by the Uniform Commercial Code. Now, whether you're involved in the Uniform uh, Commercial Code by uh, performing commerce or not, that's for you to clarify with them. But when it comes to them, they are performing commerce, and therefore the Uniform Commercial Code does apply to them. So when you speak about the Uniform Commercial Code and you get pulled over by an officer of the court or you're asked to um, sign some kind of medical um, doc, uh, medical paperwork, always use um, UCC 1-308. Um, as you get along in this and you learn more stuff, you can learn other things to write down that mean the same thing and um, get the same effect. And basically what the 1 dash is the uh, reservation of your rights. And in that, it clarifies that um, without recourse, without prejudice, or words of the like are sufficient. Anything of the like is sufficient. So the only, the only requirement for a reservation of rights is your intent of reserving those rights. And part of that intent, when we're denoting the UCC 1-308, or in other words, using it. Okay, there we are. So anyway, when, when using the uh, UCC 1-308 in regards to signing any document or anything, when we talk about intent, intent is a mental thought. And it is a, it is a prerequisite, let's say, to anything else. So when you're signing a document and you want to show your intent, you also use the reservation of rights first. Before you sign, before you write, before you print, before you make your mark, before you authorize, you make it your intent first. That is known as notice. And so like I said, um, the like language like words can be used and are sufficient and so you can use without recourse you can use um, um, as I do now I use all rights adhered to dot 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 and then just my first calling but what people call me is to me it's not a name it's my calling and so I use just that and that's the lowercase k-e-i-t-h um, so it's, it's just your intent, and you have to make that clear. You have to give them notice. And that's the next point I want to talk about in the UCC is the notice. Mm -hmm. Under Section 1-202, it speaks about notice knowledge. So that once you give them notice, they now have knowledge. And if they're expected to know, as they are in law, sitting on a bench... They know they're not supposed to practice law from a bench. They know what a signature is. They know what a mark is. They, they know what an autograph is. They know what the common law is. They're deemed to know the law in order to administrate the law. So they already know this stuff. And what you're going to do is you're going to give them notice by giving them notice that you notice the notice. In other words, you're going to use the, the UCC 1-202, giving them notice that you know of the Uniform Commercial Code of Notice and of your reservation of rights, and that they now have notice that you've reserved your rights and given them notice of that, period. Now, along with that uh, UCC 1-308 and UCC 1-202, we're also going to let them know of UCC 1-103, 
wherein it gives you the hierarchy of law and it says that they're they're part of the purpose mm -hmm. of the uniform commercial code in section 1-103 which is the construction of under the construction of the uniform code it's true it's construed to be um conform to the uniform values of all of the jurisdictions in other words that goes right back to what they used to use in the old days or in past days UCC 1-207 wherein it explained that the code was construed to be in harmony with that of the common law so it's Again, today it's still construed to be in harmony with that of the common law. It's just worded differently under 1-103, section A3. So read this stuff and learn it. And then we turn around and we see under section 1-105 of the UCC, it talks about severability. And in that severability, it talks about the validity of the contract. And so what we're going to talk about in 1-105 and as far as validity is the jurisdiction is foreign. So their contract jurisdiction is foreign to your common law jurisdiction. Yet it's construed to be in harmony with that of the common law. And therefore under your reservation of rights and their notice, that you, your notice that you've given them, you're now going to let them know of Uniform Commercial Code 3, or Section uh, Title 3, Section 502, wherein it talks about dishonor. And the reason we're going to use that is because when they use your Social Security number to access that birth certificate account, they've already transferred the money, the quote money, on the ledgers. It's already done on the ledgering. They've already been paid. And you can now do a UCC 11, which is an information search, to find out if anybody's got a lien on the name. Understand that, people. If you do a, a UCC information search to see if anybody's got a lien on the name, and nobody's got a lien on the name, then nobody nobody can claim that you owe them. So somebody's got to put a lien on that name. And if they put a lien on that, that name, it's got to be done under lawful purpose. Period. Even under the uh, contract, uh, uniform contract code. So then we talk about why they're placing that lien. Or who, who they're placing the lien on. What they're doing is they're placing a lien on what's known as a United States citizen. Now think about this, people. It's clarified that if they're a artificial, corporate artificial person and they are filing suit, it has to be only against another corporate artificial person. That's the only way they can have standing to sue is if they sue a like entity. They cannot, they cannot sue a living man. They can only sue another corporate artificial person. So then we turn around and clarify that, this, that the artificial person that they've sued is a citizen of the United States. And under uh, Title 18 of the United States Code, Sections 8 and 9, it clarifies that that is a citizen of the United States is an obligation of the United States and a vessel of the United States. Period. So it's not even my obligation. And so that's why I'm that's why I'm using the UCC 1-308 mm -hmm. to show that under my private entity, my private capacity, you've infringed upon me by trying to make me the obligation of a United States citizen when you know verily that I am not the United States citizen. The United States citizen is a dead entity, a corporate artificial person which is an obligation of the United States. That's their catch-22. They cannot stay. They cannot state with those two terms uh, under Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 8 and 9, that I am an obligation of the United States. When under Title 28 of the United States Code, Section 3,
Section 15A states that the United States is a federal corporation and not a government, including the judicial procedural section. Period. Understand this, this stuff, folks, and realize that when we're using these codes, we're using them because they're under contractual terms. They're getting paid a compensation. And this compensation is a federal... Okay, this compensation is a Federal Reserve note. This re Federal Reserve note, again, is an obligation of the United States. It is also known as a compelled benefit because it's the only form of currency that we're allowed to use here in America at the time until some of us get our heads together and learn how to do this again. We're, we're having to restructure things and have to relearn the things that they, our forefathers used to do. Benjamin Franklin made his own money. We can do the same thing. That's how, it's just a matter of using the process. We have to learn that process again. So anyway, today we've got uh, Federal Reserve notes, mm -hmm. which are a, uh, a, a contract, an adhesion contract, a uh, compelled benefit, and an obligation of the United States known as a promissory note. So, think about this stuff and, and realize that when, when you're compelled to perform contracts under a monopoly known as the Federal Reserve Notes, you have no other use uh, available or uh, uh, instruments uh, available to use at the moment um, in a large capacity. There are some things you can use. Uh, there's electronic money that you can use, Bitcoin and stuff. But you can't go walk out down to a local convenience store and use Bitcoin. You know what I'm saying? So we've got to understand that um, when it comes down to these um, uniform commercial codes, we're being compelled to use them to begin with. But they are construed to be, harmony in, to, construed to be in harmony with that of the common law. So we have to make it common. We have to make our currency common. We have to make our opinions common in order for that common law to resurface. So think about this stuff, people. When we're, when, whenever we're signing our name, whenever we're making any kind of contract whatsoever, whenever we're accepting any kind of benefit that's making a contract, Whenever we're giving or offering a benefit and somebody is accepting of it on the other end, that is a contract. Um, an exchange, however, is different. An exchange is an agreed upon exchange for equal values. Whether it be a service for a product, a product for a product, a service for a service or whatever. And that's between two parties two parties, and not three. When you deal with currencies, you're dealing with three parties. And whenever you deal with a currency, you deal with a, like I said, a third party and some terms that may not be clarified. So you need clarification. And that's what's going on in this these uh, courts and stuff today and people using these Federal Reserve notes. People are just using them blindly. People are writing checks out blindly. Did you know, for instance, everybody listen up and listen up real good. When you write a check, think about logically, people. When you write a check, you write it out in verse, in letters. And then you also write it out in numbers. That's two different languages. You've just written two checks. You've just written two checks and only given one signature. Whereas if you use that same check, you write that or, or, or cash the same check in the same form, format and you qualify that signature by using UCC 1-308 first and then putting your name or your calling or whatever you want to mark. Signature, autograph, mark, all valid. As long as you qualify it. It has to be a qualified endorsement. Reserving your rights. 
unalienable and inherent and common amongst us all. No other signature is valid. Any other signature you give, you're giving up or waiving some kind of right. Period. So understand, when you write a check and you don't write a qualified signature, you're writing two checks. You're writing one in lawful money and one in legal tender. Understand this stuff, people. So again, I urge, and I'll be doing more videos later on, um, beginners, it's, it's okay to use their uniform commercial codes. Right now, I'm working on uh, transliterating the uniform commercial code into just common English. So when you walk into court, you can let them know, hey, I've already reserved my rights. And under the hierarchies of law, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, let's see, the uh, paramount laws of the land, which are common amongst us all, um, are the ones that we're going to be applying today. Because it is my choice, says the... Uh, the one that's been accosted in these matters is as a foreigner to your jurisdiction. Um, you've now been given notice, and uh, I'll, I'll let you know I believe you're acting in dishonor, da 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 da, and go on um, the uh, rest of the, the bit there, you know. But it, it's just a matter of um, understanding what these codes are in the process of using them. And hopefully uh, I'll be able to fine tune this down and and get every uh, get everybody uh, um, a little bit a little bit more learned on how to use them because this this is uh, very uh, uh, sustainable stuff that we can use against them. You know they keep telling us all any word you use can or any word you say or. Uh, yeah, so uh, when they say uh, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law, use their fucking words against them. Excuse my language there, but I'm, I'm kind of tired of this stuff, and uh, um, one of these days we're going to be able to show everybody how to beat these these people in these courts real easy. And uh, so my next one, uh, on to the next one, is uh, we're going to talk about uh, UCC 9-402, where it says secured party not obligated. And basically what we're going to do there is we're going to explain to them we're the secured party. See, this United States citizen was created because of our being born. We are the true creditor. We are, we are the ones that have a paramount security interest in the United States citizen. Now, by authenticating the birth certificate, both through the state and federal levels, we can prove that we are holder in due course of the trust. That we are the, the holder in due course of security, a, a paramount security interest in that, that estate. And, as, and it's part of the public charitable trust. So at the same time, we're going to be held accountable to act in the best interest of the United States. As that United States citizen. We're going to be acting as that United States citizen, and therefore we're going to be held accountable. So, when we do this stuff, we have to make sure that we clarify we are not the United States citizen. Um, we are not agent for the United States citizen. We are the executor of the trust. And I believe as an insolvent trust, we should be collapsing it and creating and moving everything into our own private trust. As far as that's that's my opinion when it comes to that United States citizen, get rid of that thing as soon as possible. And all you parents out there that have kids, those kids are are uh, have birth certificates known as United States citizen. Um, they're running them through bankruptcy every seven years, and I suggest you go ahead and get rid of them and create your own um, persons for them and teach them how to administrate those persons when they become adults. Anyway, um, section 9-402, secured party not obligated. And why? Because under Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 8 and 9, it speaks about the vessel of the United States and the obligation of the United States being the United States citizen. 
The United States citizen is not your obligation. You are the secured party in interest. Paramount secured party holder or security interest holder. Um, holder in due course. Um, accommodation party. Creditor. Settlor. Trustor. You're the one that grants the use of that name by allowing them to continue using it. And how you quit allowing them to using it? Like I said, when you get a hold of that cocksucker, you grab him by his throat and kill him. You collapse the trust. Collapse that trust and create your own person. Anyway, I hope that helps you guys understand a little bit better how this UCC works. Um, how the, what the uh, United States citizen actually is. And remember, anytime any court case, case proceeds, the plaintiff, look at that plaintiff and see if it's not a uh, fictional entity. If it's spelled in all capital letters and the court's spelled in all capital letters, they're fictional entities and they're coming against another fictional entity, the defendant will also be spelled in all capital letters. Chicago Manual Styles, Section 11, uh, Section uh, 1147. Uh, Section 11 1147, I think. I, somebody will know it. Um, if not, I can look back through my notes, but it talks about the uh, American Sign Language and how they're just symbols that look like the American English capital letters that are strung together to form a name known as a title. So it, it's, not, it's not you, it's, it's not. Anything to do with a living creature or a sentient being, a spiritual being, a uh, substance of life. It has to do with everything but or everything uh, of a fictional, corporate, artificial person. So, anyway, understand they're creating parity between the, uh, the uh, corporate, artificial person and the tangible, living man. And that is a trespass. That is a trespass, a civilian trespass. So anyway, hope that helps everybody understand a little bit better. For